Um, when you're ready, uh, please take it away and uh, let's begin. Great, thanks Roland. It's lovely to be back everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. And today is the seventh step. And the session's gonna be slightly different today because I'm sure you took part in a couple of the webinars uh, earlier in the summer and most of the session is going to be in the form of a discussion. But just a quick reminder of who we are. So the team behind this AI readiness is Carmel Kent, Mohammed Ali Chaudhry, Mabu Kukarova, myself, Rose Wakin, Anissa Moeni, Ben Dabule and Ibrahim Bashir. And so this is what we're talking about, the seven steps to AI readiness. And today, as Roland said, we're, we're on step seven. So I thought I'd lead, leave this up on the screen as Karine and I have a chat about this whole AI readiness for educators, because not only has Karine joined us for a couple of the webinars as a speaker, she's also been through all the webinars herself as a learner. And so I thought it would be really interesting um, to find out what your take is on this, Karim, and that's why I've invited her to, to join in the conversation with me today. So let's start with step one, logical place to start. Uh, what's your feeling now, having been through the whole seven steps, and also, you know, very, as a very, very experienced educator, what's your feeling now when it comes to that step one about trying to infuse and excite people about AI? Well, firstly, can I say that from the outset, I've got a much, I've got more clarity, real clarity and understanding that AI isn't replacing teachers, but enhancing the most important human interaction that we value in every school. Um, you know, all those, those personal interactions with stakeholders, with our children, with governors, with all of those people. And that's what enthused me because that's what we value in schools. It's those human interactions. And now that I've understood how AI can support that, that was the thing that excited me the most because there's so much for teachers and school leaders um, in their role to do it it's completely overwhelming you yeah. really have to be superhuman to meet the requirements of the government of the lea your parenting population your students and your local community and a number of other organizations who all believe that school is the conduit for the important information that they have that they want to pass it by so this throws up problems and, and strategic questions to be answered constantly now I've learned that AI can, can provide support to education, educators like me by giving us clarity on what we're doing that works successfully and with our approaches um, to key issues. For example, recruitment and retention or working, you know, um, or uh, parenting or even teaching and learning or well-being. that's you know, one of the huge issues that keeps coming up over and over again. Um, in this way, we can plan more strategically and meet the needs of the school community. Now, if we look at learning specifically, we have the possibility. Can you, can you still hear me? Because it's saying my yeah. connection. Sorry. <laughs> we have the possibility that learning is more personalised, more flexible, and inclusive. Um, and it will help us to give feedback to the learners uh, about what is being learnt as well as the fine grained understanding of those sort, small steps that they undergo to how they're learning and the misconceptions that they have. And importantly, it'll help us to understand the levels of anxiety they have before they begin to learn because no learning can take place. You can't start a day's learning unless we understand the mood and um, the well-being of that, of that young person. Now, these are some of the big issues that teachers face every time they plan a lesson. Um, so, what I got really excited about and enthused about is that can, it can help to evolve, evolve and transform education um, in effective and efficient ways. And that's really important because we're so overloaded with the stuff that's coming at us and it can engage learners in new and exciting ways where the intended learning objective can be met because too many lessons, it's just getting through the stuff. Yes. So as a consequence of the, the newfound learning that I've done through these seven steps, I, I, and I genuinely mean this, I believe that the AI is something we need in our toolkit, in our teacher's toolkit, to sit alongside us. And I think that's important that we're using it. We're using our human interactions with this specific tool to make learning more efficient. So 
I think that's if I could sell it to anybody and genuinely sell it with real authenticity, this is what I'd say to them. Uh, that's great. And I couldn't agree with you more about, you know, AI not replacing teachers. It's just so not what, what AI is about. It, it really is about unpacking the complexity and helping teachers understand a lot more about what's going on. So it's really great that, that, that you've picked that. And I'm pleased that you, you're excited about AI. That's brilliant. Um, and the second step, which was really about sort of tailoring, honing, but really identifying key challenges that you want to focus on. And I remember having a you know, conversation with you about the, that, uh, you know, earlier in the summer. And also you've been helping us with the analysis of some of the data that we've been collecting during the lockdown and now as, as lockdown perhaps only momentarily it's, it's, it's not national we don't know what's going to happen in the next few weeks um, and in particular you've been interviewing head teachers from across the country and I, I think it'd be really interesting to hear from you obviously if you have any challenges yourself you want to bring but perhaps some of the challenges that you've been hearing those head teachers talk to you about over the last few weeks and then maybe we can find one that we could pick forward pick to then work on the three, four, five, and six steps. Okay, so, so I'm up to about interviewing, I mean, I think I've done nearly 100 interviews now, and uh, one of the things, obviously, that's clear for every single school, whether state, independent, preschool, whatever their designation, is that the, the normal routines that they've established for their communities are completely out of the window. And many of the school leaders that I've spoken to, quite a vast majority of them, have had concerns about how they make that organisation far more agile to respond either to a second, another national lockdown or a second lockdown or another emergency, because, you know, it might not be COVID-19, it's any emergency. So it's making their organisation far more agile than it's ever been before so that they can continue children's learning and deliver the curriculum that they need to, be it in the classroom or be it remotely. And with the remotely, the thing that keeps coming up over and over, and these are just two of the main issues that I, I think have come up most of the time, um, have been that, that how do they ensure that greater engagement of learning when it's online? Because it's a whole different feel teaching online and getting that human connection and that engagement from short students at different ages um, across the board when you're doing it remotely and when it's in an environment because too many of them have found that just replicating what they did in class online isn't working. So I think if I had to pick out two key things and, and there was a host of them, they would be the two things that, that really come to the fore instantly. <laughs> Thank you, Roland. I thought I was being silenced there. No, I think they're two great challenges. I, and actually, they're challenges that exist normally, but they're exacerbated um, by the pandemic situation, aren't they? So yeah. thinking about, you know, how you, you provide um, the breadth and the depth of the curriculum and, and you do it, whether students are learning at home or, or at school. It, it's definitely an AI um, compatible challenge. Um, and, it, and it reflects on what you were saying just a moment ago about AI being something that, that's in your toolkit that can help you understand more about where learners have misconceptions, that the, the, the detailed steps that they're taking as they're learning a particular concept or process. And I think the great thing that it strikes me that AI can do is to track and trace, if you like, each learner's journey through the, the, the different elements of the curriculum and, and, and the syllabus, depending on whether you're talking primary or secondary, but you know, the, the AI can really track what's been covered, what hasn't been covered, can track key misconceptions, can really help you see across the board what individual students are or are not achieving and it can do that in the right kind of infrastructure whether the learning is happening at school or at home so as a school leader you kind of get a, a, a real map of, of who's where and what's going on and then when students come back to school as they have done this September in the main you know if we had the you know well-designed AI at our disposal as a teacher we would very quickly be able to identify where each learner has, has, 
has got to with their learning because everybody's had a different experience for the past few months. They haven't been in school and then find ways of remediating that. You know, which, so it's very quick to assess, evaluate, and then you can provide that individualized, you know, remediation to try and get people back on track as quickly as possible. But of course those, you know, whilst AI can do that, not everybody has that kind of AI technology available to them. And I think that's what we want to try and um, promote is exactly how much AI in combination with really good technical infrastructure can transform learning across schools, colleges and universities. But that second challenge is also a really interesting one because learner engagement is something that we care about all the time as educators. You always want your, your, your learners to be engaged, you know, as a university teacher, you, I want my students to be engaged with the learning, you know, and it's true from tiny children to, to, to adults, that learner engagement thing. But when you're face to face, you've got so many different cues, haven't you, as a teacher, you know, to see, to, to you know, to, to see in detail, you know, when you're, when you're watching the class, you can kind of get a much better sense of where, you can read the room much more accurately when you're physically present with your learners. It's much, much harder remotely. But actually, I think it's a really good place where AI can help because AI can do that fine grained analysis of the learner behavior that can be observed through the technology. So if I'm a teacher and I have you know, 30 students online in Zoom, I see a sea of faces, but for us, for me, as my human perception of those faces, there's no depth. It's all there that the, the, the cues I would normally get a sense of, a lot of them are missing. But for the AI, that's a kind of perfect situation. It's got, you know, you know a nice, image you know a video um, of individual learners and so there's a sense in which we can build ai that can analyze you know facial expressions posture in speech we can you know analyze not just what students are saying but the tone the speed um, the rhythm of their speech and we know that um, ai systems that are built to detect emotions in learner perhaps such as anxiety are much more reliable when they have both voice and visual data to work with it's far less reliable when you're only looking at, at facial expression data so we know that those two multimodal data types can really help us to be much more accurate when we're using ai and then you imagine the feedback that you can send to, to, to the teacher to kind of be their assistant to try and replace the fact that they haven't got the cues that are normally available, but the AI can really help. And it's not just using, you know, if you haven't got Zoom and you can't see the students and you can't hear what they're saying, but they're interacting with their technology through the keypad or through a mouse or through a touch screen, of course, we can also analyze the patterns of interaction through those interface devices as well. It's not as accurate as if we have that richer multimodal data, you know, of voice and, and facial um, data, but we can certainly work with that. So we can have AI very much as the companion for the teacher, that companion that can help the teacher read the room again in the way that would normally be possible and to know whether learners are really engaged with the learning as opposed to engaged with the technology or engaged with each other or engaged by distraction or you know or whatever it is so i think ai has a very very important role to play there but that's very interesting if we think about step three and four here and we think about identifying and collating data and then looking for new data. I've just given a whole host of different data there from video data to um, keyboard, to, to mouse movements, to voice. And of course, the big thing that immediately hits me is ethics. When I think about that kind of data collection and that kind of data processing, and of course, the reason that the acronym for our seven steps to AI readiness is, is ethical is because ethics are so important. And I wonder, as a, as a teacher, how you feel about those issues of ethics within your school. I mean, you have 
huge experience of the normal ethical dilemmas that face a teacher, that face a school leader. And now there's something else coming along with AI. How, how does that make you feel, Karina? I think to start with, I think that's what puts teachers off and educators off because there's so much. Just mentioned the word GTP, you know, GDPR and watch yeah. everybody cringe. And I was at the beginning of that, you know, looking at the 90 pages of documents and trying to understand in English what that meant. So you mentioned AI and everybody just shuts down because they're thinking, whoa, hold on. But the point is, if we want to create citizens of the future that are you know, good citizens of the future, then the thing that we've got to do is just not keep getting consent from parents. Because often, I mean, even myself, I know you go onto line, it says tick the terms of reference. I tick it. I don't even read it. So what we need to start we'll do doing. Sorry. We all do it. We all do it. <laughs> We shouldn't do it, but we all do it. So I, I, I think with ethics, the thing that struck me with AI, because I was really worried about it, I was worried about, you know, a whole host of issues that surrounded it, knowing that, you know, we're still trying to get teachers, even though COVID seems to have moved teachers, you know, mountains to get teachers to use technology. The point is that you'll have the same barriers in, in getting started with AI. But I think if we start not just getting consent from parents but starting you know while we're starting fresh with this and i know it's it's in you know it's in their homes so if we want to get it into their schools let's start thinking about talking to the children about their consent because i think one of the things is it's going to follow them around and be their history so it's not you know i've got years where that hasn't followed me around some of the data you know before data collection is obviously there's loads of data on me but i'm talking about in the same way as a night a child born you know in 2020 so they need to know that we have the discussion because if we have the discussion and start talking about it to them about why we ask their parents for data collection or and trying to get their voice because children, you know, eat up to very young children and they can talk about some of these things. We just don't give them the opportunity or speak to them about it in the right way. And also it's not on the curriculum to be covered or going to be assessed. So we need to start thinking and building up this language and this um, picture for them so that they start to understand the importance of the ethical considerations about data being collected about around them. And that's what's frightened our, my generation because, you know, we hear about this data that's going to be collected about us and it could be used in improper ways, and all that, but we're not really sure why or how. So if we start the conversation and we start to understand it a bit like me doing the seven steps, it's, it's taken away loads of anxieties and things that I know that I could do now that I had built up in my, you know, the biases that I built up in my own head about AI because I didn't know, because my mindset wasn't one that was open enough. So I think if we want to get people to be really good citizens of the future with stuff that's already in their homes, you know, they've already got Alexas and Siri's and goodness knows what, then nobody even questions, but mention bring it into schools and everybody will go, whoa, you know, no, that can't possibly happen. Then we need to start having open dialogue about it because that's what brings reassurance. What brings reassurance is people discussing and finding out for themselves and having an open mind, not just listening to what somebody tells them, but finding out for themselves. And we can start that in schools at a very young age by talking about, we're asking your parents for consent. I'm talking about to very young children. One of the reasons that we do this and explaining it to them. So I think that I'm quite open-minded about that. Um, now, well, and having done technology, you know, and having utilized technology in my school for a long time, I think I'm more open-minded about, okay, so this seems to be a barrier let's explore it and find out what we can do to get around it to make because it's a useful thing that we can have in our armory and it is about what's useful in our armory to make us produce citizens of the future and help everybody whatever age with their learning so it's you know it's got a multi-dimensional um degree and I, and I like what you're saying there about starting with young children i agree because Young children are going to be, there's so much, there will be so much data about them in the world that it's really important that they understand what that means in terms of how that can be processed or how that can be misused, how it can, how can, be, how it can be used to their benefit. And, and one of the things I think is the biggest challenge and, and one of the challenges that we've discussed a lot at the Institute for Ethical AI and Education is how you get across the benefits that AI can bring, but also how you can get across the fact that there has to be responsible AI and what do we mean by responsible AI? I think there's a real risk that the clear ethical risks, and there are risks, could easily make people so anxious 
you're absolutely right. It's like, no, we're not doing that at all. And then of course you miss out on the huge benefits. I mean, just thinking about the, you know, nearly 70 million teachers we're short of across the world and thinking about how AI could help the existing teachers cope with more, be, be an assistant to help them, to, could help new people become teachers, could really help with that situation. You know, we don't want to lose those benefits. Thinking about children, you know, coming back to school in the UK, having learnt very little for the last few months, having, you know, opportunities to spend some time in the day on one-to-one -one tutoring with an AI that can help you, can help very quickly identify what you haven't understood, where you are with your math, your English, your history, geography, whatever it is, it's, it's a real valuable possibility. So we have to get the ethics right in order to stop that. Now, I do want to say something about that old mutant algorithm that uh, came our way um, a couple of weeks ago. But before that, um, I am going to say just a few, I've got a few slides on ethics because I think it's such an important point. So let me just move forward. I'll come back to this second steps. Seven steps. Oh, I forgot to remind ourselves about the importance of the difference between human and artificial intelligence, which I usually do in all of the webinars and how much our human intelligence is much richer and more complex than AI and how we need our AI and our human intelligence to work together. But thinking back onto the issues of ethics, one of the ways that we can look at ethics, I mean, there are, there are lots of different frameworks that already exist for thinking about ethics and AI but they're not necessarily um, focused on education. So this is a very well respected and, and, and very clear expression of an ethical framework from Laridi. And we have these five sort of components of this. And it's interesting to see how four of them, beneficent, beneficence, non-maleficence, I always find those words hard to say, autonomy and justice are part of traditional bioethics principles, which is a good place to look for ethical principles. But this explicability is something that is really new with AI and about enabling people to understand what the AI is doing. I really dislike the use of the word transparency for AI because it gives the impression that it's easy to just make clear what the AI is doing, what the data is doing, why the data is being processed and what's going on. Actually, no, it needs an explanation. It's not obvious. It's not a case of transparency. It's a case of explicability, knowing that people can understand and, and coming up with good explanations so that everybody can understand. And I think these principles are quite useful. And so if I just look at those in a little bit more detail, um, beneficence is about what we've really been talking about. It's about promoting well-being, preserving dignity, um, and ensuring that AI technologies benefit and empower as many people as possible. And I think that's the real crux I can see as somebody who's worked in AI for several decades, the huge possibilities that would mean that we can really empower people who are currently quite disempowered. And so we need to make sure that we really get that bit right. But of course, we don't want to do harm. So we also have to look at the non-maleficence, you know, privacy, security. These things are fundamentally important. Um, making sure that we think about the various negative consequences that might happen, um, not just through you know, data breaches, but through overusing AI technologies, you know, in, in viewing with them, them with more intelligence and more reliability than they actually have, or even misusing AI technologies. So we really need to think about those issues, but within the context of trying to make sure that we're looking to get the benefits out there. For me, it would be unethical if we failed to help people design and use AI ethically, because we would be stopping many people who could benefit from benefiting. So I think we do have to get that right. I think autonomy is, is, is extremely powerful. You know, people need the power to decide. And if you're going to have the power to decide, you need to have explained to you precisely what your data is having done to it, you know, what the AI is doing when it processes the data and, and why. Um, and I also think we need to recognize that 
it's slightly oversimplifying, but I think it's an important distinction that we can think of AI very much as you and I have been talking about it, um, Karine, as something that can help us analyze huge amounts of data and identify aspects of learning behavior that are valuable, that can be indicators of misconceptions or of progress, for example. But of course, AI is also used for decision making. And if we think about that mutant algorithm, of course, decision making in that instance was problematic. So I think we do need to think very carefully about what aspects of decision making power we need to retain as humans and, and what aspects of decision making we might be happy to delegate to our AI systems. So we need to be very careful about that. So a simple example, if we're, getting, if we're collecting large amounts of data about a group of learners working together because we want to identify when they're acting synchronously, you know, their hands are moving synchronously, they're looking at each other, you know, that might be a useful indicator that they're likely to be working and communicating together effectively. You'd need a lot more evidence than that, but it could be one indicator. Um, we really need to think about, well, are we happy for the AI to decide that there's enough evidence in the data to say, yes, there's synchronous behavior between these different students? Probably we are. But would we be happy for the AI to decide that that means these students are worthy of being put in this particular fast tracked group. Mm. Maybe we wouldn't, maybe we'd want the, the human teacher who knows those students over a longer period of time. Maybe we'd want them to be involved in that decision. So it's really thinking where the line is between where we're happy for the AI to make decisions and where we're not. And I do just want to say a little bit about biases in, in data. Um, and I, I want to thank my colleague Brenda Boulay for, for, for these slides because I think uh, that they're, they're extremely good. And of course, you'll see there's a, there's a few um, little uh, pieces of evidence about what went wrong with that algorithm for, for um, deciding exam grades. So historical biases, so situations where in the world there's already huge amounts of bias and if we are not careful, we feed that existing bias through the way that we design our algorithms. So of course, there's a, there's a huge bias in the world already between students who um, attend independent schools and students who attend state schools. And you know, they're very different in terms of the, the privilege that those groups have. I mean, to recognize that if we're designing an algorithm that's to meet the needs of the entire school population. When you think about representation bias, where um, the data that's being used to build a model might be skewed in a particular way. So maybe um, we have within that population uh, a, a larger number of uh, students of a particular um, type, or we may have groups of a particular size. We need to recognize that and make sure that we don't skew what we do because we've got an uneven population and an uneven representation of that population or a representation of that uneven population in the data. And then there are problems around measurement bias. bias. Um, so one of the very, very common forms of measurement bias is where it's difficult to collect a real evidence of X. So we come up with a proxy of X. Um, and so actually in, in the exam algorithm, thinking in terms of previous cohorts results as being a proxy for predicting the current year's results. Hmm, there's, a, there's a bit of measurement bias going on there. We need to be aware of that. And, and then we can have two other forms of bias that are important to remember. So aggregation bias can occur if um, we ignore within the way that we use our AI and the way that we design algorithms and decide what data sets we need differences between subgroups that exist within the population about whom that data is representing. So a classic example from the um, grading algorithm was the distinction between state, private with respect to class sizes. So if you favour um, 
specialist subjects where the, the, the groups taking those subjects are small, then almost without exception, those benefits are only going to be attributed to um, the independent sector. And evaluation bias. So one of the things that you have to do very rigorously when you're thinking about uh, introducing an AI is to test, 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 to make sure that the model that you've built is adequate. And that means, and, and I think another interesting example of this beyond the, um, the, the exam grading algorithm was the recruitment bot that was, was set up by a very large company that only um, selected male employees because the, 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 the data set on which it had been tested only really had um, male examples because the population of employees was largely male. Now that actually has many biases in that particular example. But if we think about the evaluation bias and we think about the A-level grading system, you know, it wasn't actually po po possible to test that algorithm because you didn't have um, the same measurements from previous years to the ones that you had for the current year. So for example, teachers don't normally rank students. So you couldn't test the accuracy of the algorithm with respect to ranking from previous year's data because that data didn't exist. So you have to be very careful um, that you test very thoroughly. And so I wanna go back now to our seven steps. Sorry, I should have put this slide in again here just so I can do that, but there it is. And back to talking to Carrie. Now I've kind of done that little bit of input on ethics because I feel it's really important that we think about ethics very carefully. It's why you know, we have ethical so clearly in the name of this framework and, and something we need to be thinking about, but very much as you were saying, Karen, to try and make sure that we get the benefits. Okay, so thinking about that situation, thinking about learner engagement and with your head teacher's hat on, how would you react in that situation where you know, somebody like myself is coming along and saying, well, okay, we can really help you with learner engagement as long as it's all right for us to have, you know, data of students' faces, learning, voice data, data of their interactions, your school data that you've collected for years, you know, as you're, with your head teacher hat on, what, what kind of questions might you ask me or what your, might your reaction be? My reaction would be, whoa, to start with, I'd want to know, um, I want to be very clear about why they need the data, where the data is going to be stored, who's going to own the data. They would be the questions I, I would, and interestingly, I was working with a school that was thinking of bringing some AI on and they were excited. It was a bit of um, uh, AI that was going to be, to be, to be helping children personalise their learning. And I said to them, before you meet with the company, can you tell me what questions you're going to ask? And they weren't asking anything. And I said to them, they said, well, we've, you know, parents, we've asked the parents, told the parents what we're going to do, and they, they're quite happy. And I said, okay, so who, who, who owns the data? Who's inputting the data? Um, what's, how do we know the questions right? What is it, you know, what is it you're trying to, to, to find out? And none of that, and that really worried me that they hadn't, and, you know, no idea was going to stored, how long it was going to be stored for, could they get it back? Um, they, so, you know, I, I stood back while the company came in and just listened. And, and, and what was interesting for me is it was reeled off while it's stored in the cloud. And so the person, the teacher turned around to me because often it might be left to a teacher to, to, to meet. And the teacher said, so it's stored in the cloud, so it's safe. And I said, OK, so what does that mean? And how do you know? And, and they didn't know. And I think that's part of the problem that we don't ask enough questions because we're worried about looking um, unprofessional that we don't understand all the technologies and the, the clouds and everything else like this. So they're not asking, they're just relying on that organization who says, yes, we're the biggest company. We, you know, we store them securely in the cloud. You have no worries at all. And then, and, and they're not checking on any of this or how, who owns the data or, you know, who's the, even inputting the data um, and what questions are being asked. To input yeah, no, it, it's classic. And I think you're right. I think we need to find a way of, and, and that's really what this, this program is all about, is helping educators to feel more comfortable that they know a bit more now and that actually they should be asking the questions and they should never, ever, ever feel that they can't ask a question of a company that's trying to sell them something because they feel they might look stupid. I, because I, you can, sorry, what I'm sorry. that company doesn't know anything about much about 
the teaching and learning that the teacher is an expert in. It's just different expertise and, and mutual respect is, is really important. So teachers should feel free to ask whatever question they want to in order to understand it. Sorry, Carrie, and I cut you off. I was going to say, I, I think that's one of the things that the seven steps has done for me personally, has made me rethink about data differently. I think, yes. um, you know, because in schools, even just our own data, we're absolutely saturated with it. And I think in, in one of the other, st in, in step th uh, three, I think you asked me questions about, you know, what sort of data we've got and how do we collect it, la, la, la. And, so, and I gave you this long list of data that we have, um, you know, and, and I think now when I reflect back on, on all the years in education, I know that some of the questions, strategic questions I was asking myself, um, I hadn't, I hadn't really got the right question and the data I was using wasn't necessarily the right data or had been collected in unbiased ways. And that's really, you know, it's really, it, it really hit home to me that, that session because um, in my school, um, I, I did employ a data analyst, for example. And the reason I did that is because I'd been analyzing data for years, but it is not my expertise and I do not know the fine grain analysis of data. So knowing I was dealing with 150 people coming at me, it seemed to me that it was really good to employ somebody, which was quite unusual because nobody had ever heard of a key stage two school with a data analyst, but it really helped me basically, if I'm being honest, bat off Ofsted and people like that because this person could yeah. argue better data than they could. I'm being absolutely totally honest honest with you i could argue data but not in the way that this person could analyze it however the data she was analyzing when i think about it came from things like surveys schools are hugely you know all schools do surveys that they design themselves so you know were we asking the right question was the data that we had because if you think about um well-being well-being is happening in loads of schools at the moment with surveys going out right, right left and center some that they're buying some schools can't afford them they're they're making them you know um what sort of information do we have about well-being well we have absenteeism we have medical issues we have reports from advisors um you know we have and then we have the surveys we send to parents and to children about their anxiety levels and how they're doing of records on bullying all those sorts of things but the question on well-being is so wide to start with are we really answering a question that's going to give us enough you know have we got clarity of what we actually want answered and when i'm thinking about it now i'm thinking oh my goodness, some of the schools I've been talking to, and myself included in my own school, actually we were just grabbing this data and throwing it in and then you end up with four different answers to the same question because none of it quite works. So you're, pick, you're picking what you think, what you think, so there's a bias in bias in bias. And if, you know, was that data, when I think about it, was the data collected in consistent ways? Because sometimes I'd have this teacher do it and sometimes I'd have this teacher do it and they've got their classes and then they're running around, you know, perhaps giving it out to parents in different ways and children, you know, if it's a younger child when they're asking the children, the questions asked in the same ways, you know, what were the gaps, you made me think about the gaps in the data. Um, and, and the consent bit with the ethical, when I think about it now, no, we didn't really talk to the children in the way that I'm talking that we should do now. I'm not practicing what I'm pre you know, what I'd be preaching now because I wasn't doing that in any consistent way because I didn't train my staff and the surveys we sent out surveys like confetti we had governors doing you know, three question survey at parents even because you could catch the parents and and analyzing them but the people analyzing them weren't trained to analyze them or trained for those questions so were the questions biased and you know it just blew my mind that session it literally blew my mind I mean it, it, surveys are actually very complicated to design and, and yeah it's easy to fall into to traps with them so it's a really good point to make but, but Ofsted's uh, always asking for your evidence and let's you know whether yeah. I like Ofsted or not and you know I think I've made my feelings very clear about how I feel Ofsted is a an education inhibitor in many ways I know that you know the education prevention team want you to have advice you know advice on their surveys and all sorts of things um, and so people trot out the survey they've done that gives them yeah. the advice that we report yeah. back to parents and and now knowing what, what I've what I've learned about AI, I haven't looked towards data capture advices like voice analysis. I did on a very limited level before I went looking at the, the speech techniques between teachers and students having time to answer questions. But that was done by another organisation. But actually, did I? You know, that wasn't that wasn't in my mindset with the survey. So I think if I was to do it now. The one thing, and it came out of your one of the um, sessions. I can't remember who, whether which session it was, 
But one of the things that is clear is that we need, if we're going to do a survey, let's make it worthwhile. If we're going to collect some data, we need to give the time, a time frame to capture that data activity. Rather than bashing them out, we need to have a time frame and a plan and make sure that we do one survey well rather than 20 surveys. Yeah. I think that's that's a really good point. And actually, talking of time, I, I want to leave ten minutes at the end for questions oh. in case. No, don't apologise. Um, um, so that anybody listening can ask a question. Um, but I do just want to say something about um, the, the the steps applying and learning. So one of the things that you and I have talked about before, Karine, is 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 the the confusion between machine learning and AI, and are they the same thing? Are they not the same thing? And I think, you know, when we talk about applying AI techniques to the relevant data we brought together, actually we use lots of different techniques, and some of them may not be called AI and some of them would be called AI um, and some of them do fit into the machine learning description and, and some of them don't and I think um, the, the, the way in which we talk about AI has changed it's a moving target when I first studied AI many many years ago it was a disciplinary sub interdisciplinary subject that, that was very much about understanding intelligence and then thinking about how you created machines to mimic that. But because the, the predominant form of artificial intelligence that is bringing about the biggest changes in the world is machine learning, machine learning has become often thought of as being synonymous with AI. And that's not really true. It is a very, very useful form of AI, but there are many other ways that we can produce technologies that can behave in usefully intelligent ways that don't use machine learning. So machine learning is a technique where an algorithm is designed to process masses and masses and masses of data and learn something from that data. So the classic examples are um, identifying images, particularly of cats. <laughs> there are many examples on the internet of AI systems being trained to recognize a host of pictures of lots of different things, which are pictures of cats, which is a much harder task than you might think. For humans, it's easy. For AI, it's hard. So basically, these are systems that process masses and masses of data and learn something, whether it's to play a game or whether it's to diagnose a disease or whether it's to recognize an image, whatever, they learn and they can improve in the way they do this, the more data they process, the better they get at the task that, that, that they're involved in doing. But there are also other ways in which AI can operate. You know, the, the sort of old fashioned rule based approach to artificial intelligence, where you have a system that doesn't learn, it can't change, it's hardwired in the program code. Um, and the AI makes a decision based on a set of rules can still be very useful. And in my book, it's still AI. It's not machine learning. It's just a different form of artificial intelligence. So I think it's important to recognize that not all artificial intelligence is machine learning. Machine learning is one form of artificial intelligence and it's the predominant form. The, the problem, as I alluded to in one of the first lectures, is that most machine learning it's very hard to explain why particular results has occurred. And there's lots of work being done with explainability. Whereas systems that use, for example, a rule base, it's much easier to explain which rules are fired and therefore why uh, the process, the AI process has led to the particular result. So we use a variety of different techniques to analyze the data to help people understand more about the challenges they're trying to solve. But the whole point of the seven steps is to learn from that data, to learn from this process what you really need in order to tackle that challenge. And so it's really about getting educational institutions, schools, colleges and universities to a point where they can make a good decision about where to spend their very meager resources on AI. If they feel, yes, AI could be useful here, but you've got a very limited budget, precisely what should you buy? So by the end of the AI readiness, we hope that 
any school, college or university would feel much more able to make decisions about where AI was more useful for them. And that's really important. Hopefully also to know how to ask those questions of the people who are trying to sell them the AI. And I hope in the process that we might also help um, educators to see where actually perhaps some of the things they're doing could be done in a more streamlined and efficient way because they understand the data more. Before I open up for questions, can I just I'll come back to you again, Karine, and say, you know, what would you want to say to you know, a head teacher like yourself now about AI and about what they should be thinking about? It's really hard. They've got to cope with some children being in school, some not, uncertainty. You know, what would you say to them? You've been very positive and, and, and said ways in which you, you can say positive things about what AI can do, particularly with respect to not replacing teachers. But what's your kind of final thought before we go to questions about this whole seven steps? I, th I think for me, and I have been talking to head teachers recently with all the different problems they've got is that if they use a framework like the seven steps, if they took this framework, it's going to shine a light and a pathway as a mechanism for support for a step-by-step -step approach so that they can look about how they can art, they'll sort the wheat out from the chaff of the questions that they, they want to understand so they can create a more personalized, inclusive learning environment or whatever is the challenge that they're facing. But more importantly, it's going to give them confidence because they, they're asking the right questions and they're thinking slowly through the issues in order to weigh up the risks and benefits mm -hmm. so that they can have a more strategic approach and get their solutions to the real problems that they find. So what I would say is look at the seven steps and be open minded. That's the thing I would say. You've got to be if you want if you want to change the way you're working and get rid of some of the anxieties that you face, the problems that you face now, be open minded, look at the seven steps, look at the question you want to ask yourself and go through to see with the seven steps if you can come out with a strategy and knowing the resources that you need to use. And as you say, the resources are meager, particularly in state school. So actually what this will do for you is, you, you know, you've got, if you like, normally where we're throwing money at things that we shouldn't be sometimes this is one way of having um some some control and certainty that you've really thought through the issues and financial yeah. implications of what you're doing in order to achieve the you know solve the problem that you want to achieve so you know use that as a framework because that's what they need at the moment what they need is help and support in really concrete Absolutely. ways and the seven steps will give that to you great Thanks, Karine. Right, Roland, are there any questions? I will stop screen sharing now. Um, yeah, we just, uh, one, one or two here, um, Rose. So, um, uh, and I'm pretty sure that uh, both of you will, will probably want to speak on this. Um, somebody's asked, um, can ethical AI uh, be used uh, for ethical learning in schools to tackle problems such as uh, racism, gender-based violence, mental health problems, uh, you know, bullying, stress, suicidal ideation, um, you know, anything like that that sort of uh, teachers or, um, you know, sort of uh, people doing pastoral care or, or welfare, you know, how, how could they possibly implement that to approach those kind of situations? It's a very interesting question. I'll have a quick stab and then pass over to Karine. I mean, I can Im immediately think of two very different ways of tackling that and there will be more. Um, it's whether you would want to use the AI to um, help people understand other people's perspectives and experience more clearly, which you could certainly do using AI. You could personalize um, a, a training course so that you made sure that you understood enough about the individuals who were being trained to, to really try and illustrate a very different perspective to the one that they naturally hold. And I can think of lots of different ways you could do that. And if you were to engage with intelligent augmented reality and, and, and those kind of things, you could really make it quite immersive and quite powerful. But there's a whole other way in which AI could help. And that might be by um, being able to spot the problem before it happens. So perhaps being able to highlight to a teacher that um, 
somebody was, was, was moving into a very dark place, for example, because the AI would pick up on, on some behaviours. Now, again, lots of ethical challenges in that, but the potential benefit of being able to nip something in the bud before it, it develops into something more serious, um, again, means that I think we have to try and find a way over those ethical issues so that we can have an ethical AI way of doing that. They're just two very, very quick thoughts on that, but it's a really, really interesting question. And it's really great to have a question that's not um, specific to the traditional areas that people may think of AI as being you know, around the particular curriculum subjects, you know, particularly in STEM, that's, you know, thinking about it, which is very important, but it's, it's great to have a very different question. Thank you, whoever you are. Karine, do you, do you want to add something to that? I, I would just say yes, in terms of like the well-being or the bullying or anything like that, one of the things that, that interests me is actually voice analysis and mm. seeing how teachers respond to the issues that are brought to them. You know, what is it they're saying? How are they saying? What's their tone? What's their body language? And adaptive learning, you know, could measure some of those things that we could make our training better and more comprehensive to our school and its community. So that would be a really interesting take mm -hmm. on having a look at, at that in terms of, you know, real CPD that meets the needs of our community and the issues that are happening surrounding, for example, how do you support children when they're bringing issues to you? What do you say? How do you keep that conversation open? I mean, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah, I think that's really, really interesting, um, Karine. I, I could, so loads of ideas now you know coming up you know i can think of lots of ways in which you could do that and that that would be extremely valuable as you know and again it's very much in that supporting the teacher the teacher's the best place to provide the support for, for, for the students but actually the ai could really help the teacher that, that's really interesting the communities of learner are different in the issues that happen so when we're talking about bullying in one context and and well-being and another they're very different particularly within communities so that's yeah. why the training angle really interests me because it's so important that we yes. utilize the right language and, and our approaches to meet the, the needs the culture the people that we're dealing with in our community yeah. that, that's really true uh, any other questions uh, Roland um, so uh, same uh, chap has actually um, asked a follow-up this is um, sort of kind of uh, Bit more kind of global high level question really but um uh, they're just saying um as educators uh, are we concentrating more on career oriented education uh than ethical learning to make sort of better citizens and it feels like it's very much the former rather than the latter but in sort of education going forward what, what's your perspective on on you know using the sort of techniques that you've got and and using the, the emerging technologies, you know, that, that we're seeing to actually change the way that, you know, education functions for society. Yeah, again, it's fascinating. I'll, I'll have a quick stab and, and then pass to Karim. In a way, that's kind of a question that really taps into my motivation for looking at human intelligence, which is the basis for much of the recent work I've done is the fact that I think we need to understand much more clearly how incredibly sophisticated our intelligence is in many ways that we haven't traditionally appreciated in our education systems because you know, we've wanted to produce people to work in this industry or that industry or the other industry. Whereas actually, you know, the parts of our intelligence that we can't automate are still really significant and, and fabulously sophisticated. So actually, you know, using our AI to help us focus on those feels like a much more holistic system to me and, and moves away. But Karin, do please add your take on that. Well, I, I, think, a question. I think for me, I'm trying to, as an educator, make the young person that I'm, whichever key stage I've worked in, to be life ready, world ready, work ready, not one thing. You know, that it's a complex, they're going through life's journey and they're going to have to be learning all their lives. So for me, we're not doing one thing. We're not just focused on one thing. And education has to transform and move forward. And as Rose said about understanding our own human intelligence, if education doesn't transform, then we're always going to pigeonhole ourselves and our beliefs in a very hierarchical system rather than unleashing the 
powers and the um, abilities that we really have. You know, my own son left university, sorry to say this to everybody, because he felt that he, he it wasn't meeting the needs that he has. Now, he works by chance in robotics and leads a team and, and, and the, his path was from an appre apprenticeship route, learning how to weld. But he got so interested in robot for his own reading through YouTube videos and goodness knows what, nothing from his mother because I wasn't doing anything to do with this in, you know, in AI or anything to do with robotics or any of this stuff that he does now. But he did it through his passion, his interest, his motivation and a route that wasn't the traditional one prescribed. So what interests me is that we are developing a whole person. And I think the bit, Rose, when you did that book, Machine Learning, that blew my mind because it, it, it frees so many people to understand the abilities they really have that we dampen down for them in education because they yeah. don't meet the required GCSE grade or whatever grade we want to test or exam that we throw. And, and instead, of, you know, helping them to excel, we, we make them feel they can't instead of they can. I'm, I'm not sure that I've answered your question. Sorry, whoever answered that. But for me, it's the whole that we're educating. Well, I think that's a really interesting point too about you know, particularly in the modern world, really, it, it's, it's not the right thing to train people for a particular job or a particular career because we don't know that that career or job will be here in, in however... Young people have micro careers. My son's had, you know, he's no age, he's had four careers. Yeah. He has been, a, a, you know, he has been a welder. He has worked in project designing seats or some damn thing. He's in robotics now. Before that, he was in sales. Yeah, exactly. he does stunt riding, teaches it. He actually teaches for a school stunt riding. So, and he's done this through, through passion, through, and through pulling together all the areas of learning, the warp and weft of learning and what, and, and having the resilience to get up and have a go again or get, get up and go again. And interestingly, I was talking to another head teacher who, who was telling me that her, her partner was really upset because their son, one son's gone to university and the other one hasn't gone to university. Um, and I said, okay, so what's he doing? Why is it? Well, because, you know, she, he's worried he hasn't gone through the business route, but he's got 13 people working for him and started his own business and he's not even 21 yet. So, so there are different routes through to learn and we mustn't stop that. And this, this understanding our human intelligence so that we can utilize AI to support and help us grow further. For me, perhaps that's what I should have said to you to start with. That's what excites me. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, the warp and weft of learning is a brilliant place to stop. I love that phrase. Roland, back to you because we're just about out of time. Thank you, Karine, for, for joining me. That was a really yeah, enjoyable question. Thank you. Thank you. One more question, Rose. I'm going to leave Karine to answer the question just because I have to move on to give another talk, but absolutely. Yeah, um, I, I will. I will. I will listen to the question, and if I have chance to, to give a very quick answer, but I know Karen can stay on a little longer. So, Roland, go for it. So, um, uh, very quickly, uh, how can AI help develop emotional intelligence, uh, particularly ah. with uh, very young children? I, I think that's a really great question. I don't think AI can be emotionally intelligent, but absolutely, I think it can help us to become more emotionally intelligent. I think we can. We can use scenarios, we can, we can, with older children, we can certainly show them the way that they are or are not um, developing human intelligence. We can analyze children's interactions and, and create games that will help them interact with an AI that will try and develop the particular aspects of their emotional intelligence that perhaps are not being developed, or perhaps actually they're excelling in certain areas and we can stretch them, you know, there's a lot we can do. And I'd love to talk more about it, but I have to go now. So I'm going to say goodbye and thank you. But I will hand back to Karine and Roland and thank everybody for joining. And I apologize that I have to nip off so smartly. Thank you. Bye. Karine? Sorry. Have you got what? any, do you, do you want to speak anything on um, AI's, uh, how AI can assist in the development of emotional intelligence, particularly well, I think, for I think... kids? I think Rose said about the scenarios and the analysis of interactions, and that leads us then to use immersive environments. So um, there's lots of stuff that you can utilize where people can be put in that situation to explore their reactions to it. And I think that's, that's been really interesting looking at once you've got that analysis and those scenarios. So for example, I've been sent a, um, 
a, a VR kit that puts that's that specifically I did, following the analysis specifically puts young people in roles and situations to, to see where they would go next and to see how they feel and to understand how they feel and I've got another one where um, for teachers it explains it gives them a different feeling so it puts them in the situation of the child and they see some really difficult situations that happens to that child that forms um, attachment, you know, uh, you know, the attachment issues that some child, children have so that they can understand by stepping into their shoes. But again, it's first, the, the first bit is finding, you know, what are those scenarios, analyzing um, students' reactions so you can use it for students and then how can you use it for training for teachers? Brilliant, brilliant, right. That's answered the question. Thanks, Karine. Um, uh, I think uh, we'll we'll leave it there then because uh, we've uh, we've just run past uh, the uh, five o'clock mark. So um, thank you very much, Karine, uh, for coming on and, and chatting at length with Rose. Uh, and thank you all to our audience. Um, if you all uh, scroll up to the top of the chat, if anybody wants to um, uh, sign up to Thursday's session with uh, Professor Ben Blay, um, that's going to be uh, quite different from this one. That one's for educational businesses. Um, the link is in there. The link is also on our Eventbrite, so you can just follow our organizer profile on Eventbrite if you need to. Uh, and for everybody else, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thanks, Kareen, and uh, have a lovely evening, and uh, best luck for the rest of the week. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank Bye. you.